Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where after five years of going through the Old Testament chapter by chapter, we are now in the Gospel of Matthew. Good morning, Susan. We're actually live. We're traveling right now, and usually when we travel, we do pre-recording because internet isn't always as reliable as we'd like it to be. We decided to take a chance this morning that our internet connection would be uh, consistent enough not to cut off the broadcast. We are studying a really important chapter today and strangely enough one that has generated not the chapter itself but how it gets it in, interpreted today a lot of confusion among God's people and of course we're talking about Matthew chapter 24 Matthew chapter 24 has this chapter already come to pass good morning Paula good to see you or hear you. I guess I'm not seeing you. I'm, I'm, no, I'm seeing you type. I'm just not seeing you face to face. Am I awake yet? No, I haven't had my cup of coffee and I've been up since about two o'clock, as is my custom. Uh, Matthew chapter 24. Has this chapter already come to pass? In chapter 24 of Matthew, Jesus describes future events and Today there's a common consensus that all of these things spoken by Jesus have allegedly already happened. And you hear this a lot. And is this true? Uh, Still others suggest that it is immature of a believer to look to end time events that if we were really spiritual we wouldn't be concerned with any alleged second coming of Christ is this accurate you hear this all the time it's a standing joke in evangelical pulpits and it has been for years well are you a pre-tribulation believer or a mid-trib or a post-trib and the man in the pulpit he just chuckles well I think it'll all pan out in the end as though it doesn't matter what we believe. It's, it's made the idea of the second coming uh, a punchline. And is that an appropriate attitude? And when we read in the scriptures, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. And this chapter today is ground zero for a lot of this conversation And so, you know, we ask the question, are we simple-minded to believe that Jesus will one day physically appear again in the earth? What do you do? And there are those that, and again, these are not fringe elements. There are people and leaders that are household names, and they are considered centrists in the evangelical movement, that uh, you hear suggestions that they believe that Jesus will not literally return again. That his coming will be a spiritual coming, not an actual return of Jesus bringing back, coming back in the form that he brought up out of the tomb, the one that Mary saw when he told her to touch him not. And you would think that 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 type of thinking wouldn't come anywhere near Bible-believing Christians. But there are many, many, many sincere believers who have heard this kind of teaching and it's always presented as now this is really deep truth and those immature believers won't get this and so it panders to this uh, ideology of mysticism and if you believe this alternative uh, way of looking at this then that that just makes you more spiritual than everybody else and so it's 51 verses and Let's read it and let's just take a look and again, let's go to what the scriptures actually say. Let's look at these events that Jesus speaks of and ask ourselves as we read them, 
have they evidently come to pass? Some of them have, but have all of them? And how does that bear on our thinking about the coming of Christ? Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and he departed from the temple and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. So the disciples want to take Jesus on a tour of Herod's temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say to you, there will not be one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Did that come to pass? Do you think the the prophecies of Jesus come to pass? He said not one stone. Well, what do you do with the wailing wall? There, There are many stones at the wailing wall that are held to be, believed to be, part of the temple that haven't been cast down yet. What does that tell us? And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? In other words, when will the temple be destroyed? But that's not all they asked. They said, When will these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they asked three questions. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and will betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Has the gospel been preached into all the world, every people group, every nation? That's a great question. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, what's that? We're going to talk about that. Spoken of by the prophet Daniel, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him that is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. For the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. But then, if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as lightning comes from the east, shining even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For whithersoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So, in verse 1 of our chapter, the disciples of Jesus point out to him the impressive buildings of the temple of Herod. To which Jesus replies that there will not be one stone left upon another that would not be thrown down. Now, did this prophecy come to pass? Well, if you believe that the Wailing Wall is part of the temple complex, then it did not come to pass. Now, most would say yes, that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, about 40 years after the resurrection of Jesus. But again, what about the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall? Uh, Jews don't like it to be called 
the Wailing Wall. They say it's the Western Wall. It is believed, the Western Wall, to believe to be a surviving structure from the Temple of Jesus' time, which was the Temple of Herod. If this wall stands and actually is part of the temple complex, then Jesus' prediction did not come to pass. You say, well, that's semantics. Is it? Well, Jewish sources point to this, and they scoff at the words of Jesus as false prophecy. Is this true? If Jesus predicts the temple would be destroyed, and that this wall is actually part of the temple, does that not invalidate the claims of Christ? In Matthew 24, Jewish sources and unbelievers agnostics and atheists they point to this and they say yes he said it would happen and it didn't happen and we can point to it right now there in the city of Jerusalem however is that the only way to look at this archaeology now listen this is something you won't hear archaeology suggests that this wall was not a direct portion of the temple complex that wall is not unimpeachably, unquestionably, indivisibly, and only to be identified as part of the temple complex. That is not a settled question in archaeology. In fact, it was more likely to be identified as a structure added by Herod in order to give him access to the temple without having to pass by among the common people, but was designed to be an elevated access for Herod uh, without having to pass among the common people, but to give him privileged access by a means that others were not allowed to use. So what they call the Western Wall, what we call the Wailing Wall, might be more accurately defined as Herod's wall, and what are they really crying for? Are they crying for a temple, or are they crying for King Herod? Something very sobering, something we need to think about, and say, well, how can that be? Well, we have to decide either Jesus' words came to pass or they did not. While this view is most certainly rejected by most, If it is correct, it means that the people are not lamenting the temple. They're lamenting a structure dedicated to Herod's effete opinion of himself that he was too good to be required to enter the temple along with the common people. So that's a fitting opening to Matthew 24, which in recent years has become a source of controversy as to its predictions by Jesus. Listen, there is a school of thought in the body of Christ that contends, and you'll hear people dismiss Matthew 24. They say, well, that's already all come to pass. And if you haven't read it, you're going to say, oh, oh, really? Well, maybe I don't know what I thought I knew about that. And there's plenty of people that will speak with all authority that will say to you, well, that's all come to pass. There's this school of thought that says everything that Jesus said in this chapter has come to pass and therefore must be looked at differently than might be suggested on the surface. Now that generally comes under the heading of a preterist viewpoint. That's the theological term, preterist, something that says, well, it's already come to pass. I'm just going to suggest, and I could have a long talk with you about this, but let's just read the chapter. Let's consider what we've read and ask ourselves if Seeing it as having come to pass is the simplest understanding of the chapter or not. Or if perhaps some things have come to pass while others have not. The subject at hand is the destruction of the temple. Remember, that's the opening of the conversation. Jesus says the temple of Herod's going to be destroyed. And then the disciples come and they ask him three questions. Now notice they're not asking one question, they're asking three questions. One, they said... When shall these things be? When will the temple be destroyed? Two, what will be the sign of Jesus' coming? And three, when shall be the end of the world? Now, if what follows in Jesus' answers is actually a reply to all three aspects of the disciples' questions, 
then we would expect to find things revealed, which speak of an immediate fulfillment, describing events to take place not long after Jesus' death, and also to speak of things to come after, because the temple was destroyed right after Jesus' resurrection, and the end of the world hasn't come unless you and I are... I don't know what we could say about that. I would suggest that it's not controversial for us to say the end of the world hasn't come, although... You will, these people that believe in the Predator's viewpoint, they will insist that the end of the world that was being referred to is something that's already happened. Therefore, the answer as to whether all these things in chapter 24 have already occurred, well, what about the fact, what would be the sign of thy coming? Has Jesus returned already? Well, some people say he's talking about his return when he came out of the grave. Uh... And uh, has the end of the world happened yet? Obviously not. Although some teach that, again, Jesus' return was his appearance after his resurrection and the end of the world was the destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem. In other words, the end of their world, the end of Jewish culture as they knew it. And to be honest with you, that, that just stretches credulity in the context of what the disciples were actually asking Jesus to speak about. And these things are important. Listen, people hear this and they, it's, they find it distasteful. I, I don't want to talk about that. This just sounds like doctrinal wrangling. Well, you better figure it out because we're, we are a people who are supposed to have a cry in our heart, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. Now, how does that, chorus, how does that um, correspond to the prevailing attitude that makes the second coming a punchline. Well, it'll all pan out. Is that a godly attitude? I don't think it is. Yet it is. I've, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times in our pulpits. Of people of saying, well, we're just, we're just so spiritual that we're not concerned about that. We're, we're, we're deeply spiritual. We're not concerned about when he's coming back. So in verse 4, Jesus warns the disciples, he says, don't allow men to deceive you. Well, that's, a, that's a really good word of counsel when we're studying the end times. One of my mentors said he's seen people wait out into the book of Revelation and never come back. A very important point because there is much deception surrounding the subject of the end times. Jesus says, he says, many will come in his name, in other words, invoking the name of Jesus, and they will say they are Christ. Now, surely there have been many that have claimed to be Christ. I remember when I was a kid, there was a, a Eastern mystic who took out a full-page ad in the New York Times identifying himself as the reincarnation of Christ. Is that all we're talking about? I don't think that's going to deceive anybody. You know, the fact of the matter is, the word Christ means anointed. In other words, he's saying many are going to say in the name of Jesus and claim to be anointed, but are they anointed? Many ministers today use the name of Jesus and they claim to be anointed, yet people hearing them don't know how to distinguish anointing from charisma. One of the great lack of discernment in Christian culture today is, first of all, most Christians know nothing about the anointing. You talk to people who do not believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues, they have no concept in their thinking. I'm not saying they're not born again, but they have no concept of the anointing. You talk to them about the anointing and they'll say, what's that? On the other hand, there are people that you do understand something of the anointing, but we've confused charisma something that is emotionally evocative with anointing. You see this real strong in the worship culture of uh, the church, that we have developed a very keen sense of emotional attenuation in how worship is conducted, the style of music, the instrumentation, the verbiage, the poetry of worship, the visuals, the optics of worship, that provokes an emotional response whether God was involved in it or not. We say, oh, wasn't that anointed because it evoked something emotional 
And so we don't understand the difference between skill, talent, and charisma, and anointing. And Jesus is warning about confusion in the end times, confusion in this area. We have to be able to tell the difference. Just because somebody says Jesus, and you don't hear that much in church these days, or in Jesus' name, just because someone is compelling in their music ministry or their oratory does not mean they're anointed from God. And unfortunately, the majority of Christianity, even evangelicals, have no concept of the anointing or the unction of the Holy Spirit and therefore are very vulnerable to this kind of deception. Just because someone's convincing doesn't mean it's of God what they're saying. That's why we need to be like the Bereans in the book of Acts. Take it and go to the word of God to see if these things be so. We, we, we are not anchored in the word by listening to preaching. We have to get anchored in the word by studying it for ourselves. Jesus goes on in verse 6 and 8 to say, 6 through 8, to say that just because there are times of war and tumult, such as earthquakes, doesn't mean the end is near or even taking place. There's a suggestion then that at the end time was not immediate to Jesus' thinking to events that were taking place in his day or what he saw regarding the destruction of the temple that would come not long after his death and resurrection. He's implying by extension, he's implying that the thing, a lot of important things were about to happen. It didn't mean the end was near. In verse 8 he says these are the beginning of sorrows. And then he just begins to describe after the destruction of the temple would come a time of protracted persecution. Well, that, that took place. Most eminently, in the three centuries immediately after the destruction of Jerusalem, thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of believers were cruelly tortured and executed by Rome and by Roman emperors up until Constantine made Christianity a protected status religion in the days of his reign. So we could say much of that came to pass. In verses 11 through 13, Jesus then describes a time of false prophecy abounding and the love of many growing cold. Well, that certainly describes many different seasons in Christian culture from Constantine's day right down to our day. That descriptor of the love of many growing cold and false prophets could fit the church in almost every decade, every century since the 4th century, including the day that we live in. But the promise is that what do we do? We endure till the end. What does that mean? So you have two things. You have people going off the deep end, following after prophetic uh, voices, and then you have those that are sitting back not listening to anything or anybody, and they're cold in their faith. See, we have to endure coldness of heart and the brutalizing of the truth that's so common both in and out of the church today. It's very difficult to know what is truth. If you notice that, you listen to the news today. And uh, I purposely, if I'm going to listen to the news at all, I'll be sure to fact check every news item by seeing what do all the four major networks say about a certain item. And what you hear is, uh, the only thing I can conclude is they're all lying that none of them are telling the truth because truth doesn't mean anything anymore. What is truth? That's what Pilate asked Jesus. And it's astounding to me that even in the press, that at one time in Western, the Western world, the press had some level of integrity. They had a reputation that they could care less about. They have prostituted themselves to their political ideology and, uh, And you can't, no matter who you're listening to, they're all skewing the facts, and we know the truth has to be somewhere in the middle. And you get wore out with it. And Jesus is saying, hey, he that endures to the end shall be, what? Shall be saved. It's very difficult to know what is truth or not because our culture places a higher premium on opinion than it does actual fact and place and considers or condemns as naive anyone who takes a faith stand. So it's not just about what is true in terms of current events, but any idea of saying, well, I believe the Bible's true, and people roll their eyes. And they say, well, 
Isn't that a cute Sunday school lesson? In verse 14, Jesus says that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. So, has the gospel been preached with signs following to all the world? In reality, in spite of massive missionary efforts over the course of many centuries, we cannot definitely say at this moment that the gospel has been preached to every people group and every nation of the world. Certainly there can't be that many people groups or nations that have not heard the gospel. Many believe that missionary and evangelistic efforts are the key. That They believe we're going to bring Jesus back. Have you heard that preaching? They say we're going to bring Jesus back by the preaching of the gospel. And I don't say I completely agree with what they're thinking, but I understand why they see it that way. And always remember... We might have preached the gospel into all the world a hundred years ago, but what about the five generations that have come up since then? People that have lived and died. It's like our children right here in our own country. Children, are, whole generations of children coming up, they don't know who Jesus is. This Kitty, Kitty, we were at a, a gas station the other day, and Kitty made an offhand remark. It was faith-based, and, and she said something about the Lord, and the guy said, well, who's that? And she said something else. He said, well, what is that? Implying that he didn't have any knowledge of anything to do with God or anything to do with the Bible, had no knowledge of it. Well, what an astounding thing that that could happen uh, in the United States. And then in verse 15, we see reference to the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. Now, here, notice that Jesus calls Daniel a prophet. If you talk to a good Jewish rabbi, ask him, if you have a Jewish friend, ask him, is Daniel a prophet? And they will say, no, Daniel is not a prophet. You know why they say Daniel was not a prophet? Because Jesus said he was, and they don't agree with anything Jesus said. Say, well, no, Daniel was not a prophet. Uh, They will quickly tell you that. Because the viewpoint of rejecting Daniel as a prophet, and here's what they won't tell you, came about after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD because Jewish authorities could not accept Daniel as a prophet and reject Jesus as Messiah. Therefore, they rejected Daniel as a true prophetic voice and they depreciated his writings in their canon. Now, what is the abomination of desolation that Jesus said, Daniel was talking about. It is when it is the standing in the temple of a pagan lord claiming he is the Messiah. Now, in reality, before Jesus said this, there was actually more than once that a conquering army, a conquering general, went into the temple and claimed that he was the Messiah. It happened at least twice before Jesus actually said this. But he's saying it's yet to come to pass. Now, if a false messiah is going to stand in the temple declaring himself to be Lord, does that mean the temple will be rebuilt? Maybe. Maybe not. Because it's always possible that the temple referred to might be a spiritual temple because Jesus said his body was the temple. The apostles taught that we are the temple in our bodies, that we are the temple as the body of Christ. We're the temple. So maybe we're talking about a false messiah who will deceive the Christian and the Jewish people all together and stand in the spiritual temple of these two great religions and be accepted as the messiah. And that's a possibility. I'm not saying one way or the other. Uh, I'm saying that when it comes to prophecy, you better not be getting dogmatic about anything. When you start insisting what's going to have to be, uh, you you might just think twice. Uh, Not that we can't trust the scriptures, but we just don't know it all. Even in studying, we have to, and this scripture talks about this, as we're going to get to in just a minute, that it's Jesus states very plainly what we can know and what we cannot know. So, Jesus then describes a time of unparalleled persecution that would come upon the people in the Middle East and, in fact, all the world. Now, has this come to pass, the persecution Jesus describes? 
The years after the destruction of the temple were a terrible time, but they did not rise to the level Jesus described as being so bad, he said if it were not, he possibly said if the days weren't shortened, no flesh would be saved. Now, we read that as evangelicals. We say that people will lose their salvation. That's not what Jesus was saying. He was saying that it would be a time of upheaval that would be so bad that humanity would come to the point of extinction. You see, we've read that. We say, oh, people just backslide till there's a danger that nobody will be born again. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think what he's describing is a time so bad that if God did not intervene, humanity would become extinct. And we now, and you know this as well as I do, there exists under the control of ungodly men the ability to render humanity extinct and the planet uninhabitable in a matter of 20 minutes. And it's the grace of God that it doesn't happen. So uh, we could say that what Jesus predicted uh, then has yet to come to pass. Humanity was not brought to near extinction in the upheaval that came after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 A.D. What's my point? Some of what Jesus spoke of came immediately to pass. Some of what he described has yet to come to pass. If you're going to accept his words at face value, not reading into them some forced agenda of personal interpretation. So Jesus gives warning about false Christs, claiming that he has returned in secret. Well, he came back, but it's a secret coming. Paul dealt with that in the book of Colossians and in many of his writings. He said there were those that say that he had already come back. And Paul was correcting that. That's why he spoke in 1 Thessalonians about the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the trump of the archangel. He was talking to the Thessalonian church who had been deceived into thinking that all of that had already happened. This is important to consider because today the idea of an apocalyptic return of Christ is under assault in Christianity as never before. The doctrine of the rapture is more commonly repudiated than it is defended. And those who believe in a second coming, a literal second coming of Christ, are scoffed at and they're laughed to scorn from the pulpits of some of the most conservative churches and denominations in the evangelical movement today. Many are teaching that Jesus' return will be spiritual in nature in the hearts of men and not in a visible, literal return that we will ever see. But the words of Jesus in verse 27 are very clear. They identify this as false doctrine. He will come as the angel declared at the Mount of Ascension in the book of Acts. He said, Jesus said, Every eye shall see him as lightning is from the east and from the west, and the angel said at the Mount of Ascension, this same Jesus, as you have seen him go, shall likewise come again. And I've heard people read that and repudiate it and say that's not what he meant. He's not coming back. He's not bringing back that physical body that went to the cross and came out of the grave. It's going to be a spiritual return. And I don't see how you can twist the words of Jesus to mean that in any way, yet they're doing so. There's something in man that wants to avoid the dread consequences of the accounting that will come when Jesus comes to reclaim the earth as his possession. Now, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon will not give her light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. Now, in the past, when we lived under the specter of nuclear destruction during the Cold War, preachers would say, that's an atom bomb going off. Is it? I don't know about that. He said, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Uh, now, learn a parable. How can you mock 
Thessalonians chapter 4, The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet him in the air. Isn't that what Jesus is describing here? How can you mock that? Um, I understand, you know, that people, I don't believe in an escapist mentality. And that's, see, that is the insult that's foisted by so-called deeper teachers on people that believe in the rapture. Oh, you just want to escape. You're just wanting to run from your problems. How do you deal with that? Is that what's happening here? What do you do? How do you reconcile? How do you trivialize what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4 in reading it in the context of what Jesus says right here? He said, The sun, sign of the Son of Man shall appear, and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and verse 31, will send his angels with the sound of a trumpet. Sounds like First Thessalonians 4 to me. And uh, gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. When is this going to happen? Verse 32, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth his leaves, know that summer is nigh. So when you shall see these things, know that it is near even at the doors. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Verily I say unto you, this generation, and you have to ask the question, when is a generation? And you get ten answers. But the Bible gives us one answer that cannot be disregarded as to how long a generation is. Till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no man can know it. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, do you realize the power of the word of God God's word cannot be broken. That is, you want to talk about a seal placed upon the word of God? When Jesus, who is God on earth, says no man can know, I don't care if there were 5,000 people that knew at the moment he said it, that when he made this statement, that he rendered it absolutely impossible for any man to ever know the day of his coming. He says no man can know. And so anybody who says they know, they're, they're breaching scripture. They're saying so in the face of what Jesus said. No man can know. Who are you going to believe? Jesus or Edgar Wisnett, who said Jesus was coming back in 1988. Or in many others who have set dates. No man can know the day or the hour. Of course, they say, well, you can know the, the week and the month. Is that, are we really going to split hairs like that? But as it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Two shall be in the field, and one shall be taken and another left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, and one shall be taken and another left. Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord come. Now, people say that that's what the Romans did. They would come and decimate, the, the term is they would decimate the population by taking one of, uh, from every family. Two women were in the field. They'd take one, kill them, and, and leave the other as a, a message. But as he's talking about, he's not talking about a conquering Antichrist figure decimating the, the, the population. He's talking about God himself, the Lord, taking one, his angels gathering one and leaving another. And people want to twist that up because it brings the fear of the Lord in your belly. You know, one shall be taken and another left. We don't, we don't like that. So we're, we try to water it down. We've got lots of theologians and pastors and preachers standing in pulpits every day poo-pooing this whole idea. Oh, well, it'll all pan out in the end. Let's, let's go to Dairy Queen. Really? Is that, well, is that the posture? Is that, is that the response Jesus was looking for when he handed this down to us? He says, Know this, watch therefore, because you know not what hour your Lord shall come, but know this, that if the goodman of the house had known what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. So it's the Son of Man equated with the thief. Boy, that'll turn your head around. He comes like a thief in the night. 
Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord had made the ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is the servant whom his Lord in coming shall find him so doing. Verily I say unto you, he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him, and in an hour that he's not aware, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, in verse 29, Jesus says that the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give her light, and the stars will fall from heaven. Has that come to pass? People who hold the preterist viewpoint, they say, well, yes, of course, that all came to pass when Jesus was on Calvary. The sun was dark, the moon didn't give her light, the stars fell from heaven, and they will talk about lunar eclipses and solar eclipses and meteor showers that we've had on the earth 24 hours a day since the earth has stood. Uh, so is this what Jesus is describing, or is he describing something much more apocalyptic in nature that will affect all of humanity in a blazing display of supernatural signs heralding the coming of Christ? The fact that Jesus describes it in connection with his return would say again to us that these things will be unambiguous events that will leave nothing to question in direct advance of the appearing of Christ in the heavens to all mankind. Now, again, people see this, and it seems childish to the pseudo-sophisticates of modern theology. But the language is clear without any confusion. And doubtless we cannot say that those things have happened in human history yet. Then we come to verse 32, which has almost certainly come to pass, the fig tree being restored. It speaks of the reestablishing of the nation of Israel, which took place in 1948. Now, I'm not date setting, but I just want to talk about the language here. Pay very close attention because Jesus says that the generation living at the time that Israel become a nation, if that's what is meant by the fig tree being restored, and most people agree that it is, that uh, Jesus is saying that the generation living at the time Israel would become a nation in 1948 would not pass away till all things he's speaking of would come to pass. People suggest that means people born in 1948 will be alive and walking around when Jesus comes back. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, but the language is quite clear. The question we ask, how long is a generation? Some people say 18 years, some 15 years, some 20 years, some 30 years, some say 40 years, and they've got Bible they'll pull out to prove it. I like to let scripture interpret scripture. We're not going to turn to it, but if you will read Genesis 15, 14, and 16, Genesis chapter 15, 14, and 16, you will see that God himself, speaking to Abraham, identifies a generation as being exactly 100 years. It's like, un un it's unambiguous. God plainly states without any question, you don't have to interpret it, read into it, pray about it. God says very plainly to Abraham, that a generation is a hundred years. So that would suggest to us that between 1948 and, 19, and 2048, 1948 and 2048, 1948 is when Israel became a nation, and 2048 is a, the end of a linear generation by the way God defined it himself in Genesis 15. Well, I would say that that generation is actually a specific number of calendar years, which would be the simplest interpretation. In any case, you'd have to stretch these verses completely out of proportion if you're going to rigidly hold to the commonly held view that all of this has come to pass. All I'm saying is I think we ought to be paying close attention to what's happening in the next many years leading up to 2048. Am I saying Jesus is going to come back? Well, he said no man can know the day or the hour. 
But yet he also said this generation shall not pass, and God set a generation at being a hundred years. And if 1948 is the time Jesus is referring to when the fig tree blossoms is the restoration of Israel as a nation, then 2048, that time period, is pretty compelling. It makes me think. Uh, he has permission to come before the end of this broadcast. Some people said, well, I wish he would. Uh, verse 36. Jesus starts summing up his remarks. And he says, regardless of what he has said thus far, he says, no man, not even Jesus himself, knows the day or the hour when these things will in totality be fulfilled. He says the days of the end are going to be like the days of Noah. What is that? Business as usual. And then God will intervene. The important thing to note is that the people in Noah's day were ignorant of what was coming, and even when Noah warned them, we know that Noah preached, we know that Enoch preached and warned them, they only scoffed. Now the time frame in which these things will come to pass will be a time of great mockery of allegedly simple-minded people who are thinking of the end times suggested in chapter 24, and it'll be people that... They'd just be so deeply skeptical of any literal interpretation of these scriptures. And isn't that the way it is today? What's our responsibility? The Bible says, comfort one another with these words. He says, behold, I come quickly, comfort one another with these words. He did not say, behold, I come quickly, now break out into a church fight over these words. And when you start talking about the end times, you have more of a church fight, a theological debate, and distinctly unchristian behavior. But we're supposed to comfort one another with the coming of Christ, not get into contention with one another. We're to be watchful, verse 42 tells us, because we don't know when the Lord is coming. If the scripture is true, you, there can be no accurate date setting. We can look at the times we live in and we can sense that, yes, the circumstances seem to be fortuitous, but in the end, we are to conduct ourselves in godly fear, paying attention to how we treat one another, because he says people that aren't serious about expecting him to come are going to mistreat one another. And doesn't that typify how Christians treat each other? The only people they treat worse than the world is how they treat each other. Christians are hard on each other. But I tell you what, if we're living in anticipation of the coming of Christ, I think it'll change how we treat each other, don't you? Or at least it should, or maybe we need to get born again again. And so we, we have to know, it's like my wife says, God is God and he can do anything he wants anytime he wants. He can conclude the human race at any time with a wave of his hand. He can bring all humanity to judgment without any need to ask our permission to do so. Therefore, we're found to, we are to be simply found to be faithful, as Jesus' concluding words suggest. Rather than being abusive toward each other or taking unfair advantage of one another, let us be diligent to make our calling and election sure in the light of the potential and powerful and imminent coming of Christ. I was talking to uh, a pastor just yesterday that he's building a ministry here in uh, uh, Las Vegas where we happen to be today and he's doing a good work and he's planning to for some time and he's being criticized because they're saying he's not spiritual because Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Why, why are you planning all of this? It's they're, they're suggesting to him that he's not spiritual and he's in unbelief because he's planning to help people for years to come. I wrote a book called The Next 50 Years, A Prophetic Perspective and the most solid criticism I got was that's total false prophecy because Jesus is coming back before then. Where do these people come from? Jesus made a statement. He said, occupy till I come. That means this, and I'm building. My wife and I are building to have an impact for the gospel a thousand years from now. If Jesus doesn't come back and my wife and I go by way of the grave, we're making an effort to leave a deposit in the earth that will be having a positive impact on the gospel a thousand years from now. But he has my permission to come back before I say, I'll see you tomorrow. And so we need to look at these things, and most importantly, we need to ditch 
this skeptical, more spiritual than everybody else attitude of scoffing and mockery and put down that is coming against people who believe in the simplicity of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I ever saw an antichrist agenda that's infected the church and infected the pulpit, that's it. People scoffing and mocking and joking and turning the return of Christ into a punchline. Is that what Jesus was hoping to see when he handed this chapter down to us? So, Father, we just thank you for your word. And I pray that, God, this chapter, as we've read it today, would, would provoke in us a return to the simplicity of your truth, to the simplicity of what you've said. You said, unless we come like a little child. Lord, we don't want to be so sophisticated that we contaminate the purity of Scripture with sarcastic and unbelieving attitudes Oh, God, give us the humility to approach the scriptures with simplicity in our heart and expectation, God, that we would say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. God bless you. Have a great day.